Before we begin this podcast, please be advised that the following episode contains language that some listeners may find offensive and inappropriate. The opinions expressed by the host and guests are their own and do not reflect the views of the podcast producers. Listener discretion is advised. Why do they think that you did those six murders? No, I didn't have a gun. No. And I'm the only one that got arrested. I'm the only one that did time for the charge. I just did, took it on the chin. I started selling drugs at eight years old. Uh, the first time I got arrested was 10 years old for stolen car. Dwayne, it's my understanding that you actually committed a crime that put you in prison at the age of 15. And I was put in the cell with a guy like 50 some years old. And as soon as they said that, the captain has punched me in my face. And when he punched me in my face, I hit the floor. But it didn't really hurt. But it, I played like I was knocked out. And they told me to get my B ass up, right? You are now listening to the podcast, Voices of a Killer. I'm bringing you the stories from the perspective of the people that have taken the life of another human and their current situation thereafter in prison. You will see that although these are the folks that we have been programmed to hate, they all have something in common. They are all humans like us that admit that they made a mistake. Will you forgive them or will you condemn them? They are currently serving time for their murders and they give us an inside glimpse of what took place when they killed and their feelings on the matter now. Here are the voices of those who have killed. In this episode of Voices of a Killer, we delve into the captivating and troubled life of Dwayne Taylor. From his early involvement with gangs to his conviction as a juvenile and his alleged involvement in six other murders, Dwayne's story is one that sheds light on the challenging realities of growing up in a violent neighborhood in St. Louis, Missouri. Dwayne's story is one of the more unique ones on this podcast. You can truly say that he has had his whole life shaped by the justice system. Initially convicted of a tragic murder in 1994 at the age of 15, and now almost 30 years later, we have the opportunity to hear his side of the story as he reaches out to us from prison. Join us as we explore the untold aspects of Dwayne Taylor's life, delving into the events that shaped him, his struggles, and the ongoing battle he faces from behind bars. Brace yourself for a gripping narrative that challenges preconceived notions and invites us to question the justice system that holds him captive, leaving us with much more to ponder about the complexities of crime, punishment, and redemption on this episode of Voices of a Killer. Tell me about your childhood, Dwayne. Would you say it was normal? Did you have some stress in life? Would you uh, abuse or what? It was normal. I used to get a lot of whoopings. I grew up in a household with a mom and three sisters and a stepfather. And I pretty much, out of having three sisters, it caused me to really step out in the streets real early, like five years. When I was five, I pretty much was already in the streets pumping gas and carrying grocery bags and stuff like that. Do you feel like you grew up in an area that was like a lot of drug activity and gang violence and stuff like that in St. Louis? Yes, sir. Yeah, it was surrounded. Uh, all, it was everywhere, all around me. So you basically probably saw like drug deals and people getting beat up and probably some shooting and stuff like that around the inner city? Yes, I seen it all because when I was a kid, at, at seven, I used to be like a runner for drug dealers. Like, when because I come up in the crack era in the 80s, so it was like I run to the stores and the Chinese food places to get buy food for the drug dealers back then. So I was able to see how they sold drugs and made their money and stuff like that. So they would hire you as a kid to do stuff. You'd make money off to the side as a kid. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I went to the store for them and buy like their juices because they can't leave their post while they out there selling the crack. So I run to the store, run to the Chinese places and buy them boxes of rice and stuff like that. And when I come back, I just stay there hoping, waiting for another urn to run. So when was the uh, first time you ever got arrested? First time I got arrested was ten years old for stolen car. What did your parents think about you running the streets? For years, from six to ten years old, I camouflaged because I was like playing church boy, a good kid, go to school and all that. But once I was out of school, I was just being bad. You know what I'm saying? I started selling drugs at eight years old. Yeah. And so it's like my parents, they never knew that none of that. 
because I was able to count by doing all the right things, going to church, doing good in school. But once that was over with, I was in the streets full time. Dwayne, now 44 years old, reflects on his childhood and the circumstances that shaped his path. Growing up in a household with a mother, a stepfather, and three sisters, Dwayne experienced the typical challenges and discipline of family life. However, living in St. Louis, an area marked by drug activity and gang violence, Dwayne was exposed to a harsh reality from an early age. Dwayne's resourcefulness and street smarts became evident as he became a runner for drug dealers by the age of seven. This early involvement gave him first-hand insight into the drug trade and the money it generated, offering a unique perspective on the inner workings of that world. Being surrounded by such influences quickly led Dwayne to joining a gang. Growing up on the west side of St. Louis, this meant he was quick to sign up with the Boys of Destruction. What's probably something like really bad you saw on the streets when you were really young? Like, you ever see somebody killed or anything? Yes. Yeah, I've seen several people killed on the street corners of where the gang where I was from. I'm on the west side of St. Louis. Where did you grow up in St. Louis? I grew up on the west side. West you probably heard of a gang called Boys of Destruction. Okay. And I joined up when I was like eight years old, like my late eight, late early nine years old. What did you have to do to be able to join that? Uh, pretty much I grew into it, but I did a lot of stealing for the gang and stuff like that. And, and I pretty much had to fight the guys that was my age, but already a part of the gang. And I fought them like every day to where it came to a point where they just wanted me to become friends with them and become a part of the gang as well. So, Dwayne, your environment was really like just geared towards what you're talking about. But do you feel like you had an option to go a different direction? Nah, not then. No, not at all. You don't feel like anything in the community was reaching out to you saying, here's an option for you instead of that? You don't feel like that was out there? Nah, no. Because even back then, like even I, I was a Boy Scout, right? In our neighborhood, the, the public school had a Boy Scout uh, troop. And we was like two in. Even the troop was just radical, you know what I'm saying? And that was a Boy Scout, so it was just bad everywhere, from school, on the streets, you know what I'm saying? And it just was, even in Boy Scout, like I said, it was pretty much all the members was in there, you know what I mean? Is your uh, parents still living? My mom, she died at 39. No, she passed away, and my father's still alive. Do you have support on the outside? Do you have people that reach out to you and, and show you love? Yeah, yes. My my sisters, I got my sisters, they still look out for them. Even my old my old, old gang buddies and stuff, they still look out for me and got mad respect for me. Have you ever been shot before? Yeah, I've been shot before in my chest at 13 years old. Why'd they shoot you? I was a gang member. I was a crip, so I wore a lot of blue and gold, and, and I just got shot in my chest. Was it up close or from far away? It was up close. Probably like the width of a car. Probably the distance of a nice fast small car. And it was a rival gang member that shot you? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know. I'm sure it probably was, but I really didn't fully know. But I take it as it was. St. Louis sits on the banks of the mighty Mississippi River, and its giant gateway arch marks the symbolic entrance to the American West. This is not the only dividing line that runs through the city, though. The west side of St. Louis is known for being a predominantly poor and black neighborhood that still to this day shows the scars of the segregation era. Home to several housing projects that were built during the 1940s and 50s, by the 70s and 80s, Cass Avenue was the most notorious section of the city, from drug kingpins claiming turf to project and neighborhood wars. This was the perfect breeding ground for gangs. By the late 1980s and the early 90s, most of St. Louis gangs on the west side would become bloods, while a small percentage became crips, including the Boys of Destruction. As a member of the gang, he became a target for rival gang members, you would think that being shot and surviving would be a sign to try and remove yourself from this world. Dwayne's circumstances meant that that was not an option. The result left Dwayne with a lasting reminder of the dangerous world he was entangled in. By the early 1990s, Dwayne as a teenager was already a seasoned member of the Boys of Destruction. Fueled by the intense rivalry between the gangs, on one day he would make a fateful decision that would forever change his life. Dwayne, it's my understanding that you actually committed a crime that put you in prison at the age of 15 that involved a murder. Tell me about what happened the day that happened. All right, I was hanging out with some friends, and one of my other homeboys, he like, man, it's some gals that was up on the street called Paige and Hamilton. So I was like, man, let's go up there. 
And so we went up there and he was hanging out, talking to the girls. But some guys from the opposite game, they came up there as well. And so it became a fist fight. And then there, after that, it became some start some shooting. And a young lady was killed. Where was this young lady at? Was she in the group or was she just a bystander? She was part of the group, but she pretty much was a bystander because she wasn't no gang member or nothing like that. Did you but know she her? was part of the group? No, I didn't even know her, no. Not even from around the street? Just She was just completely new no, to you? She was completely new that first night. That was the first time I ever seen her met her. How did they determine that you were the one that killed her? They took me up to the crime scene, and the young ladies that was up there, they said that I was up there, but I didn't do the shooting. But then they homicide and took me down to the city homicide office, and down there, the guys that I was running with, they said it was me, that I the one did the shooting. Are you the one that pulled the trigger? No, I wasn't the one that pulled the trigger. So what made them determine that you were the one that did it? Because the two guys that, that got arrested with me, they just told the detectives it was me that I did the shooting. How old were these other two they guys? They just told my dad. One was 17, and I think the other one was 16. So they were both older than you, 16 and 17. You were 15. They said it was you, and the cops went ahead and charged you with it? And charged me with murder. Yeah. Whenever all this happened, did you know that somebody had been struck by a bullet? Did you see him fall? No, nah, no. I didn't, at that night, I didn't see actually person fall because I heard a shoot and I took off running. No. So did you have a gun at all that day? No, I didn't have no gun. This is already going. You've been let out. This charge is already, you've done your time for it. You can honestly say that you really weren't the person that pulled the trigger that day? Yeah. I didn't pull the trigger. And you didn't have a gun that day? No, I didn't have a gun. No. And I'm the only one that got arrested. I'm the only one that did time for the charge. I just did, took it on the chin. The victim of the shooting was an innocent young woman, Latrina Fields. Although Dwayne had no prior connection or knowledge of her, she became an unfortunate bystander caught in the crossfire. The devastating consequences of that moment would forever alter the lives of everyone involved on that fateful day of April 6, 1994. Despite his adamant denial of being responsible for the shooting, circumstances conspired against Dwayne. Witnesses at the scene who were unfamiliar with him identified him as being present during the incident. Additionally, two individuals who were arrested alongside him later implicated him as the shooter during their interrogation by the police. Consequently, Dwayne found himself charged with the murder of Latrina Fields, and her tragic passing will forever serve as a reminder of the innocent victims of gangland violence. After the break, we find out what happened to Dwayne whilst in police custody. As soon as they said that, the captain has punched me in my face. And when he punched me in my face, I hit the floor. But it didn't really hurt. But it, I played like I was knocked out. And they told me to get my B ass up. So how long after this happened did you get arrested? I got arrested that night. Now they put handcuffs on me right then and there. As soon as the guys that I thought was my friends said I did it, they handcuffed me. And fit to the juvenile detention. And from that day forward, how long did you stay in prison? I stayed in prison for 20 years. What was your sentence? Well, April the 6th. I was sentenced to life with parole. Life with parole. How old were you by the time you made it to prison? Did, you know, Because this happened at 15. I'm sure you had trial. and Did you plead not guilty? I ended up pleading guilty. I chose to plead guilty because of the circumstances. Like, my mom didn't have no money to get a lawyer. and I was put in a position to where I didn't have no lawyer or I had to either tell who actually did the shooting. So I chose to just ride it out and play guilty because they told me that I'd just do nine to 10 years and get out when I'm like 24 years old. So here's what I think would happen because I know how this works really well, especially after interviewing so many people. If two of them both say that you did it and then you're saying that I didn't, then they're going to try to find somebody dependent on, and that's usually how that works. If they got more than one saying, he did it, and then you're saying, I didn't do it, they'll usually pick you as the perpetrator. I, I don't know why they do that, but people that talk, usually the people that talk are usually the ones that get away, and, and you probably were like, I didn't do it, and they probably asked you then who did it, and you probably said, I don't know. So that's what I'm guessing. I don't know. That's exactly what happened. 
Yeah. They had all three of us in the same interview room. And when they asked us to come, we from the we gang room. So it's like when they asked these questions, who did the shooting and all that, they'll look the other two guys, you and I would look at me and I'd be like, I don't know. And then they'll say, I don't know. So the homicide detectives, they pretty much realized that I was more stronger than them and or aggressive, you can say. So what they did was they took me to another room. And when they took me to this other room, they asked me questions again. Did I do it? I'm like, nah. They said, did I know, dude? I said, nah. So at that point, they had hung me out of three, four homicide windows. And then they pulled me back in inside this window, right? And they like, I had a little smirk on my face because they was actually trying to straighten out my clothes. And so they like, man, we got a girl dead. And so they said, wait till I meet this six foot some white captain, right? And as soon as they said that, the captain has punched me in my face. And when he punched me in my face, I hit the floor. But it didn't really hurt. But it, I played like I was knocked out. And they told me to get my B ass up. And they took me back into the room with the other two juveniles. And then there, they was crying. And so they asked them again. They said, well, who was the shooter? And the two juveniles said I was. And at that point, they put handcuffs on me. And they handcuffed me to a table. And I had never seen the streets. I pretty much had seen just didn't stay in prison for 20 years and four or five months. 1994. Dwayne's arrest and subsequent treatment by the police reveal a troubling narrative of police brutality and coercion. Immediately following the incident, as his supposed friends pointed fingers at him, Dwayne found himself in handcuffs, taken into custody without delay. The wheels of the justice system had begun to turn, but with a disturbing lack of fairness. The police officers' aggressive tactics, manipulation, and resorting to violence underscored the systematic issues of police brutality and abuse of power. Dwayne's experience serves as a tragic example of the injustices that can occur within the criminal justice system, particularly when it fails to provide equal protection and fair treatment to all individuals. Despite maintaining his innocence, Dwayne was coerced into pleading guilty due to the absence of legal representation. Without the means to afford an attorney, he was thrust into a position where he felt compelled to accept a plea deal that promised a shorter sentence. The circumstances surrounding his arrest and the pressure he faced made it a daunting choice to make. As a result of his guilty plea, Dwayne was sentenced to life in prison for second-degree murder and armed criminal action. Dwayne soon found himself in prison with adults as a juvenile, and I wanted to know what his experience was like. Whenever you got locked up in the jail before you went to prison, you're 15, going on 16, did they have you in your own cell or did they have you with anybody else? Yeah, they had in the juvenile dorm, like a dormitory with all juveniles and with like murders and stuff. So did you have to wait till you were 17 to get hauled to prison? No, nah, they put me, when I made the prison, I was 16 years old and I was put in the cell with a guy like 50 some years old. Like, as soon as I got sentenced and went to prison, Department of Corrections, Missouri Department of Corrections, I was put in the cell with a grown man. You know what I'm saying? Like, it wasn't no juvenile dorms or none of that no more. Are you serious? You were 16 years old and they put you yeah. in? What, where'd, you, where'd, they, where'd you go? Yeah. J Triple C or Laking or what? No, they sent me to Pacific because back then Pacific was like a, a level four or five override. And by me being young with a life sentence, they just sent me straight there and put me in a cell with a grown man. I'm an eating child with grown men and all that. Wow. So what was that like adjusting to prison at that age? It was pretty rough. Because what had happened was when I was in the jail, the workhouse, the city workhouse, I used to do a lot of fighting with grown men. You know what I'm saying? When they did, like we go on a child and stuff like that, I used to fight with a lot of grown, grown men because of the game. I was real deep off into the game. And so I was crip with this game called Boys of Destruction. And so what happened, I did a lot of fighting prior to going to prison. So when I got to prison, it was like a little easier because I was seeing guys that I was fighting with or they seen me fight. And so it took a little bit of pressure off of me. But people still tried different tricks and stuff against me, though, because I was only 16, like I said. You know, when you get there, you probably had a first fight, first run. How long did that take to your first fight? What happened? Our first fight, it was like like a week later. I was working in it. They assigned me to the work in the kitchen, right? And this guy, he telling me what job I supposed to do. And I immediately, immediately jumped on him and started whooping him. You know what I'm saying? Until the guys tell me, hold on, man, you tripping. He the lead man, because I didn't understand what a lead man was, but he actually was a kitchen worker, and he just helped keep things in order while the other inmates worked. 
And so I didn't know that. I thought he was like being the police. So that was my first statement that I made when I got to prison fighting. They put you in the hole? Yeah, they put me in the hole. Yeah. How long did you do? I did 14 days, which was a life sentence back then. <laughs> yeah. So whenever you went in there, you were already patched up with a gang, but that's a street gang. Does that gang exist in the prison too? Yeah, I had a lot of homeboys in the prison already. Are you patched up with the gang now? No, I ain't active. I'm not active. Yeah. I always said I was in it for life. I always said I was a lifetime member, but I ain't activated like I what once was, though. Yeah. And so you did quite some time, what, 21 years, you said? And then you got paroled? Yeah, I did 21 years and made parole. What's the craziest thing you've probably seen in there? You ever seen somebody get killed or stabbed really bad? Yeah, I've seen a lot of stabs. People get stabbed pretty bad. Yeah, they get stabbed, stuff like that. That happened on regular back then in the 90s. And what year did you go down? I got locked up in 94. I made the prison in 95, the, next, the year later. I only did eight months in the city jail workhouse. After being sentenced to life with parole at the age of 16, Dwayne's journey through the prison system was marked by challenges and encounters with violence. The transition from the juvenile dormitory to the harsh reality of adult prison was jarring. As he found himself confined among grown men far removed from the protective environment of the juvenile system, Dwayne's affiliation with the Boys of Destruction gang established in the streets provided him with some level of protection and support within the prison walls. However, he emphasized that he no longer is an active member and has moved on from that part of his life. In 2014, after serving 20 years, Dwayne was granted parole. The exact circumstances and factors that contributed to his parole were not mentioned, but it can be inferred that his conduct, rehabilitation efforts, and the evaluation of his suitability for reintegration to society played significant roles in the decision. Dwayne's release on parole marked a new chapter in his life, offering him an opportunity to rebuild and reintegrate into society. But before long, he would find himself back in prison and accused of six other murders. And so you got released, you got paroled out, yeah. and then you actually got accused of six other murders, right? Yeah, they accused me of six murders. Are you good for those murders? Nah, no sir, no. Nah, I ain't good, not at all. And you actually went to trial nah, for just, these six murders, right? That, like a week before trial, the federal government decided to just drop the charges because they didn't have no eyewitnesses. They had a guy that got caught with a gun and he was claiming that I told him about some murders and so on. And so that alone, they charged me. And I fought it for two years. And they decided, like, four or five days prior to trial, they decided to drop all the charges. And the only reason why they did that is because they knew that they wasn't going to be able to prove the charges. They wasn't going to be able to prove I sold drugs. But they knew that I was still on life on parole, and it, it would revoke my parole just getting arrested for the charges. And that's why I think they kind of considered all that. Yeah. Now... Because you got charged with those six murders, you got locked up on, because you were on parole. And even though you got exonerated from the six murders, you're still in there because of the parole violation. And you've been in there for how long now? I'm in for seven years and eight months. So you got out over seven years ago and then got charged yeah. with six murders. Those murders got dropped and they've not let you out since why do you think they've not let you out i'm still been lost i've been lost for the last seven and a half years i just have you talked to the parole board i don't know i talked to the parole board and when i go to the parole board they say there's no reason to hold me but they'll give me like first time they gave me a two-year setback then they gave me a five-year setback but they say that we have no reason to hold you but i get a setback so i have to go see them i go see them now in 25 in January of 25, and that'd be 10 years total. Why do they think that you did those six murders? Because of the, the neighborhood I was living in when I made parole, I decided not to go west and went south. And some of the people that I was communicating with, that's some of the people that they that was, they said I'm the last person to communicate with them. But that wasn't the case there. What those six people get killed for? That's what I'm saying. I don't know, you know what I'm saying? You will see if you can, if you run my name, you will see... Some of them, and they give the reasons why in the newspaper articles and stuff. They didn't have all types of stories that I was robbed and I retaliated and all different types of stuff. But I was associated with neither one of them. But what it did was it violated my life on parole. So I've been back in here for seven years 
for no reason at all, almost eight years for no reason at all, because they charged me with the murders and drug trafficking and all that, but I actually legally beat the charges, but it revoked my life on parole for the state. So that's why I'm at now. I've been in seven and a half years now on a parole violation for without having no charges or no nothing, you know what I'm saying? On the, so just the on, cases that I So basically a parole violation. Yeah, I'm on a parole violation. I got seven and a half years in on that. But I'm still up under the original life sentence from when I was fifteen years old. So I was only out on the streets for fourteen months. After doing twenty years and I think it's twenty years and four or five months or so. Fourteen months later, Dwayne was charged in federal court of two additional killings. The charges included possession with intent to distribute heroin and discharging a firearm in furtherance of a drug trafficking crime. The incident alleged that Dwayne shot Aaron Davis in December of 2014 and Juanita Davis in January of 2015. At the time of Aaron Davis's murder, authorities believe she was shot in the head and neck in an apartment in St. Louis, Mount Pleasant neighborhood. Juanita Davis, on the other hand, was found dead in the street with multiple gunshot wounds following an argument that witnesses had heard. Dwayne being accused of these two murders were enough for him to be sent back to prison in 2015. While waiting for his trial, the guy that Dwayne refers to was one Joe Edgar, who pleaded guilty in U.S. District Court in St. Louis in 2016 to a charge of conspiracy to possess a firearm in furtherance of a drug trafficking crime in relation to the murders. According to court documents, Edgar, a convicted felon, gave a 9mm firearm to an acquaintance, Dwayne Taylor, in exchange for Taylor's 22 caliber firearm. Edgar understood that Taylor intended to use the 9mm gun in connection with the drug trafficking activity and to retaliate against a woman who had stolen property from Taylor. Taylor eventually used the firearm to kill that woman. Whether or not this happened, the charges for murder were dropped against Dwayne and Edgar was sentenced to 30 years in prison. However, as Dwayne correctly stated, the charges themselves were enough to lead to a parole violation. Whilst we unfortunately do not have details of the four other murders, the fog that hangs over both the truth and Dwayne's legal situation makes it difficult to really know what will happen to him in the future. It seems like now I just figured out what went wrong, and it's like now they don't want to let me go. You know what I'm saying? It's like, no, nah, we ain't letting them go this time. You know what I'm saying? And that's how I feel right now. That and more after the break. So, Dwayne, whenever you get out, what's your plan? If you were to get out tomorrow, is it to be on the streets and sell drugs or is it to better yourself? Better, better myself. Yeah, I'm done with the drugs. I want a tow truck and a little piece of land because I like working on cars. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to be walking the right path. Do you think that's going to be a hard thing to accomplish whenever you get out and you just, you're just you starting from the bottom and the easy route is to just make a hustle of selling drugs? Yeah, it'll probably it'll be it's going to be challenging because I'm saying that's what I come up doing, hustling. I know I love hustling, right? But I realize that ain't the way to go. And that ain't where I'm going this round here. I'm going to get out and do all the right things, no matter if I ain't got much or not. But I've been blessed to have a good support group to, to help me. You know what I mean? As far as whatever I choose to do, I got support. Whether I want to go to gangbanging or whether I want to go to sell drugs or if I want to get the tow truck and a piece of land, I got people now that'll support me Do you think on whatever the, I'm trying to do. Do you think the parole board thinks that's not possible, that you're probably going to get out there and commit crimes and there's you're going to make the crime go up? And the, You know what I mean? You're going to be a statistic that gets out and that's why they keep you in there because you're not going to get the tow truck. You're not going to do something better. Do you think that's the way they think? Yeah, I think that's the way they think because, and it's not bragging or nothing, but like when I was doing the 20 years, like I said, I got a life sentence with parole, but I had 20 years in and along the way, I started to lose hope while I was doing my time. I was, I did good programs and all that, but at some point I started losing hope and I started finding myself in trouble, like catching assaults in the jail, in the prison. But then they turned around and gave me a parole date and I was like, I needed it and I wanted my freedom right. But at the same time, based on my behavior, I think I wasn't ready. So it's like they kicked me straight out to the streets with no support. I went straight to the house. Like I didn't, I gave, gave, gave me a five month date and I went straight to the streets. And it was just like they just threw me out there like they was just knowing he'll be right back. You know what I'm saying? And I actually come back like in 14 months. But it seemed like now I didn't figure out what went wrong. 
And it's like now they don't want to let me go. You know what I'm saying? It's like, no, nah, we ain't letting them go this time. You know what I'm saying? And that's how I feel right now. Whenever you got out the first time, did you report to your parole officer or did you completely just say, fuck it? No, I reported to the parole officer, did all my drug tests and stuff like that. It's interesting to know Dwayne's self-awareness to his lack of readiness to be released back in 2014. The lack of support around him and his ungracious dumping back onto the streets by the justice system led him straight back into the life he once led. It highlights how there is a distinct lack of aftercare for prisoners once they have served their sentence and also highlights the need for reform in this area. Dwayne's frustration with the situation is palpable as he serves a sentence that surpasses the time he spent on the streets as a free man. He yearns for justice and hopes that his story, shared through this platform, will shed light on the injustices that he faced and potentially garner support for his release. Whatever the truth of this situation, it is clear that Dwayne has a dream just like the rest of us. His dream is just to live a normal life with a tow truck and a piece of land. While there were question marks over whether he would ever achieve this dream, I couldn't help having some sympathy for Dwayne. As we end this episode of Voices of the Killer, we are once again left with the question of Will you condemn them or will you forgive them? Dwayne, it's crazy, man. You went to prison at such a young age. I know you got some challenges out there on the streets. I know somebody like me, uh, some white dude telling you, hey, you can do better, but you, you got different experiences than most of the world. You grow up in an environment that's difficult, but all I can say is I, I hope you can get over the challenges that are out there and accomplish the dreams that you got, tow truck or whatever it is, something better to where you don't get killed or you have to live a life that's always on the edge and where you wind up back in prison. So I appreciate you talking to me, man. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I appreciate it. I ain't normal. I'm not normal. <laughs> but I appreciate it, though. But I'm in, I ain't in bad shape at all. It's kind of hard to explain, but you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it ain't hard to explain. But, that, um, man. Hey, man, keep my number near you, bro. If you ever need something, I'll try to help you out whatever I can, okay? All right, that's what's up. All right, man, take it easy, okay? All right, you too. Yep, see you, bye. On the next episode of Voices of a Killer. How many shots did you fire at him? I don't even know. Ever since I did the Netflix, I, I was like three, four years ago. I still have nightmares and I still have flashbacks. You wrote down on a piece of paper and I quote, I got the gun and I just pulled the trigger. I'm an 18 year old girl was a six month year old. I didn't have a man or anything else. I was living by myself. So I was fearing I was scared. How has prison been for you? Has it been pretty bad for you? I just can't wait for my pain to be over that I can have better days. Justice wasn't never made for me. That's a wrap on this episode of Voices of a Killer. I want to thank Dwayne for sharing his story with us today. His ability to be open and honest is what makes this podcast so special. A big shout out to Sonic Futures, who handled the production, audio editing, music licensing, and promotion of this podcast. If you want to hear more episodes like this one, make sure to visit our website at voicesofakiller.com. There you can find previous episodes, transcripts, and additional information about the podcast. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Your feedback helps us improve and reach new listeners. Thank you for your support, and we can't wait to share more stories with you in the future. Thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Toby, and we'll see you next time on Voices of a Killer.